Good morning. On this morning when it's feeling a little steamy, I'm reminding myself to breathe. <laughs> it is so good to see you all here today. The sermonic theme is how to get along. You've heard the scripture reading. Sometimes when I am in a public space, there is a television that is up there for people in a waiting area. It's put there, I guess, to entertain us. Institutions will put it up, and often they'll put it on a station like a talk show or a judge show. This happened to me this week as I was in the waiting area. I can see why public places would put the television on these stations, because these shows, they grab your attention. I mean, when people come to court and they're talking about a situation or you're watching one of those opinionated TV shows, they really are quite engaging. Over the years, I've found myself gravitating to two shows, watching clips on social media, The View and The Steve Harvey Show. My family, we really like Steve Harvey, even though my friends, all my womanist friends cannot stand him. He is not funny to them, but he is funny to me. His show is geared toward relationship advice. That means if you're having a relationship problem or an issue, you can ask him and he will give you advice to help your relationship out or he'll give you advice on how to get a relationship. So many of the people that are in his audience they come there for advice. Even though the show was canceled, the reruns still play on Facebook Watch. He has written four books, but the book that put him on the map is called Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, which sold over two million copies. <clears throat> As the title implies, <laughs> he teaches heterosexual women how to understand heterosexual men and how to get and keep one, supposedly. Now, he's not for everyone, but he is for some folk, and he does have a pretty significant following. And his advice is not bad. But in the end, even based on his wisdom and his life experiences, it's just his opinion. The Bible gives us information, too, on how we are to get along with each other. Lots and lots of information, and sometimes what is perceived as rules. This is where we enter the biblical text today. The writers of Ephesians are writing to this new community about how to sort of get it together, trying to establish some sort of continuity. Just a few pointers on how to make your life together more breathable. Just some wisdom on how to work together and be a community. This whole Christian journey is new for them. Christianity was not that old yet, and they are forming a very new community, new relationships, a new state of spiritual being, which is why they are to put off their old self in the first place. The community just got a new jump start. If you are a parent, every new school year, the youth returning to school get excited. You would think they had been not going to school forever or had not been going for a few years. You would think the novelty of going to school had wore off. But every year, kids get excited all over again. And so every year, the kids are excited about which teacher am I going to get. If there's a popular teacher and a less popular teacher, most of the kids are hoping, I get in the popular teacher's class. I get in the nice teacher's class. There's a laundry list of supplies that parents have to go to Target or someplace to retrieve so that the kid can academically get a good start. And there are new clothes. And it's a new year where one can start all over again. It doesn't matter what your GPA was from last year. You get a clean slate, new books, new writing instruments, new paper, new school outfit, and a new grade that signatures that this is a new start, a new beginning, where in more than one way, there's going to be more that is expected of you. And so Paul is saying to this community, you are embarking on a new relationship, a new way of being. This is a new jump start. You are a new being in Christ Jesus. Put off your old self. This can be exciting, but let me pull your ear just a tad bit today on how we can get along with each other. First, the text says, we are to speak truth to each other. 
I know that some of y'all like to speak truth. <laughs> One scholar qualifies, and rightfully so, that this truth has to be spoken with grace. And when we speak truth in anger, that's not really truth. That's something totally different. I think some of us are good at speaking our truth, but we miss the grace part. And therefore, it's not only what you say, but how you say and how you package it. Some people say, well, I'm only telling the truth. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the way in which we communicate our truth makes it hard for the recipient to hear us. We have to make sure our truth is spoken in love and lots of grace. One day, two BFFs were arguing, and the other one said to the other BFF, you're selfish, you're inconsiderate, and you don't consider other people's feelings. And it was all sort of true. But how do you think that friend was able to hear it? Not much, because truth has to be perceived as coming from someone who is in your community that you believe has your best interest, that has the best interest of the whole community and not just themselves. But speaking truth with grace is part of our foundation. So in the text today, one of the ways that we get along is, hey, give your truth, but give your truth with grace. Second, the text says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. You guys know exactly what that means. In other words, get angry, but don't do anything crazy. Don't stay in that place. Don't rehearse your madness. Don't leave it on your plate. It is important to make sure before you go to bed that you address your anger. There were these two friends, and one day, <clears throat> one of them said something to the other that hurt the other one. But the friend that hurt the other friend didn't know that her words had caused pain. And so the friend never said anything, but she kept nursing the pain. You guys know where this is headed. And a couple of years went by, and the friend who unknowingly had hurt the friend held a party. And she invited that friend she didn't know whose feelings she had hurt to the party. And food was shared and drinks consumed. Something happens when you eat and you drink. Somehow your sensories go down, things get a little bit looser, a little bit more relaxed. And that friend who had been nursing that anger for two years let it rip. The words came out like vomit. And it was absolutely horrific. And the party ended. And those two went their separate ways. Anger is one powerful thing. It is not wise to let a lot of time go by without looking at anger. Because when you hold on to anger, it can become destructive very quickly. Most of us have a firsthand experience if we were not the bearers of it ourselves. A couple of replays and you can curse someone out or do something you may totally regret. Anger can cloud your judgment, and it definitely shuts down your ability to think clearly or to hear from God. Anger twists reality, and anger can twist us. Unaddressed anger can implode and explode, and neither are good for the community. Third, be kind to one another and forgiving, the text says. This past week, another good dear friend of mine passed away. I realized that as we live, that's a part of our living, that we say goodbye to dear loved ones that we care about. And so this sister passed away, and I began to remember, because that's often what we do when people we love pass away. We remember them. We remember how they touched our lives. We remember the things they did. We remember the strengths of them. And I remember I was working with this youth group in the community, and there was this one girl who was fiscally, financially poor, but her spirit was so rich. And one Easter rolled around, and all the parents had kids to buy stuff for them. And this sister walked up to me and put money in my hand and said, buy that girl what she needs. Well, we went out and we got that girl everything she needed for Easter. And when she showed up on Easter, she was dressed up so pretty. And the smile it brought to that girl's face, 
It was worth everything, everything. It does not take much to be kind, and it does such wonders for the human spirit and the community. Be kind and forgiving. This weekend, we got a brand new trash can in our house. You're asking me, why am I so excited? <laughs> Someone who shall remain nameless broke my trash can, and we needed a new trash can. And while I was in the store yesterday doing what I call retail therapy, not enough, but I got to do some retail therapy, I saw the exact same trash can. So the trash can is really important in our household because we use it daily. We put stuff in it. There are some things sometimes you even put in a smaller bag. You know when you're cutting up that meat and you know it's about to get really crazy. So you get a smaller bag and you put it in. But mostly everything goes in the trash can that has outlived its usefulness. And what do I do after that? We take it to the trash can, we as in Josiah. And I don't go looking through the trash ever. I don't revisit it. I'm thankful that the garbage truck comes every Monday faithfully to haul that stuff away. And so it is with forgiveness. We have to let stuff go daily. Take it out, expose it, release it, let it go and toss it out. And we have to pray daily and ask God to take it away from us. And we have to do it on repeat the next day and the next week. Sometimes when I have collected stuff to take to the Goodwill, I will discover that stuff has mysteriously left the bag. Because the other person in the house who shall remain nameless saw it, had some emotional attachment to it, and wasn't ready to let it go, and took it back out. And that's why we pray daily, because anger will find us, it will jump out of the bag, and it will revisit us even when we've asked for forgiveness. Come on, somebody. And that's why we pray over and over, take this, take this away from me, Lord. The text tells us that we don't have room in our life to be carrying around the offensive odor of anger and bitterness and slander and unforgiveness. We don't have room for it. I'm not talking about <laughs> anger, about injustice, but we don't have room to be carrying that stuff around. The text says we are finally to be followers and imitators of Christ. And as followers and imitators of Christ, this text calls us to remember that we play for the same team. Sometimes in church, things get tough. And I sometimes think that we forget that we're playing for the same team, all of us. Even when we have tough decisions to make, we're still playing for the same team. Yesterday, while I was in the store purchasing the trash can that I was so excited about, I came into this sports fan in the store, and somewhere you know how like you enter a conversation in the middle, and I heard him talking about his team, and he was so proud of his team, and he was talking to the cashier, and about that time, the cashier said, you know, my dad, my dad loves the same team, but I love the Green Bay Packers, and I thought, whoa, you live in Illinois? And you got the audacity to say that you like the Green Bay Packers? It must be tough in your house. Well, sure enough, the cashier confirmed, yeah, me and my dad have a little bit of tension going on. But I stopped by to say to you, you all people of God, we play for the same team. The writer of Ephesians is saying we play for the same team. We have the same values. You wouldn't know it sometimes that Christians, we play for the same team. We want the same things. We believe and serve the same God. We are members of the same body. We have a responsibility to each other. Our strategic plan this season and every season is God's plan. We just imitate and follow Jesus Christ. He doesn't lose sheep, and when he does lose sheep, he goes and he finds them. God's plan. This applies to the way we speak to one another, truth or not. The way we treat one another, like each other or not sometimes. The way we handle our words and our emotions. The work we do with God to make sure we bring something to the table. 
the text gives us a little bit of imperatives around how we are to get along with each other. Easier said than done. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Let no evil talk come from your mouth. Put away bitterness and slander. And last, be kind, be kind, be kind and forgiving to one another. Amen.